share and put this up here. There we go. All right. Can everybody see? Yes. See my screen? Can somebody say something? Yes, we can I see it. <laughs> okay, that's great. All right, let's get started. So um, welcome everybody to the weekly Sunday tour of the uh, Old Cemetery Society. Uh, this Sunday, I am not actually in the cemetery uh, for a variety of reasons. Uh, I decided to do this one using a PowerPoint presentation on Zoom. Uh, so it is a virtual tour, but it's not virtual in the same sense as we've been doing it uh, since we started the season in mid-February. And I'd like to thank John Adams for pioneering our use of Zoom in the cemetery. And I'd like to thank very much Paul and Steve and Liz for all their help um, in uh, doing the tours that I've been involved in uh, in the cemetery. And of course, we'll be in the cemetery again next week with John Azar's tour. So happy Easter, everybody. Um, of course, the Old Cemetery Society, um, I'm sure most of you are members, and uh, but uh, just a reminder that uh, we do these tours every Sunday afternoon from mid-February to mid-December, a different topic every week. And uh, we uh, sort of welcome new members. And um, today, of course, the topic is symbolism. It's Easter Sunday, and I've been doing a symbolism tour on Easter Sunday for several years, but I try to do different, different locations and different images. Um, of course, cemeteries of the, of the Victorian period, like Ross Bay, are a really rich resource for, for symbolism. The Victorians loved symbolism. And some of them, of course, are generic on the markers, and others are, give you a real clue to the personality of the person buried there. Um, the symbolism on the cemeteries, uh, on tombstones, that kind of thing really started in the Middle Ages. And uh, before that, there weren't that many personal markers that people had. Mostly it was aristocracy in that. But once that individual tombstones started being erected on graves, that's when started to see uh, images putting on them. Um, now, um, I'm going to just, first of all, show a map of the cemetery. Um, I mean, we often talk when we're in the cemetery doing tours about the different blocks of the cemetery, but we, you know, it's often too windy, as we've talked about, to hold up a map and show everybody what the sections are. And uh, so this is what the cemetery looks like now. And if you look up, uh, on, it's owned by the city of Victoria, and they have a database with uh, the plot numbers on them and people where people are buried. And if you look up, the plot numbers, they all start with a block where someone is buried. And when you think about um, symbolism, you know, we think about the individual graves, but um, the actual original layout of the cemetery, which was done in 1872, and then the cemetery officially opened in 1873 in the spring, it's actually kind of a symbol of what uh, the structure of society at the time that this opened, because it was laid out by um, uh, religion. So you see here, the, the original cemetery was just the parts um, A through K and M up here and over to this, more or less this line coming down that divides B and T. Um, and so the Presbyterians and Anglicans got the highest part of the cemetery. There's quite a slope, for those of you who aren't familiar with the cemetery, there's quite a slope going from the water, which is down at the bottom of this page, up to the top. And the Presbyterians and Anglicans got the nice high and dry part. The Methodists did pretty well too in the middle. Um, and the Reformed Episcopal Church, which was a breakaway thing from the Anglicans. But the poor old Catholics got this really marshy, soggy bit down here by the water, completely at the time before Dallas Road went in, exposed to the elements and the big storms that we get from the, the Southeast. Um, section F here, uh, was primarily um, for it was what was called the potter's field. So it was like um, the uh, uh, poor people, uh, non-Christians, that kind of thing. So that really reflected that, you know, the British, the uh, Presbyterians and Anglicans were the higher echelons of society. We think of, of waterfront uh, property now being preferred but in fact, you know, people in those days went out after church to go visit the graves of their, their family members. They would have picnics. They wanted to be high and dry and away from the cold ocean breezes. They got the best parts of the cemetery. 
So let's uh, let's take a look now at the um, uh, at some of the markers. You're muted. I don't know how that happened. Here I am. I knew I'm, I'm, I think I'm live again. <laughs> um, so uh, yes, so the, the symbols um, that we're looking at generally in Ross Bay, of course, we're looking at Christian um, symbols of redemption, of uh, suffering and sacrifice. Um, the um, most uh, typical ones, um, you know, we're talking about Christian symbols, but a lot of them originated uh, in ancient times in pagan times, like the obelisks that we see here. The obelisks are the tall pointy ones. Um, of course, they come from ancient Egypt, where they were um, uh, associated. Of course, you have the whole uh, Egyptian cult of the dead, and they got adapted in, uh, especially in Victorian times. And of course, they point to heaven. So there's a nice, you know, symbol for that. Another uh, a symbol that came from pagan times is the uh, the urn, as you see here on the top of the big Dunsmuir grave. Um, the uh, urns, of course, have origins in ancient Egypt, where the uh, vital organs of the uh, the person, the pharaoh who had died, would be placed in that so that they would have them for eternity. Uh, they were also cremation urns in Roman times. And the, um, of course, the, the, the Victorians added this lovely piece of drapery that you see up here. I'm using my cursor and I hope you can, you can see, um, I'm using my cursor to point it out. Um, that piece of drapery is actually represents the coffin pall. Now you've heard of pallbearers and the pall is the covering that is used over the casket in the church or, uh, and then as it's moved from the church to the cemetery and that. Um, we don't see them as often now, except on military graves, military funerals, where often you'll see um, a flag is dra draped as a pall. Um, but in Victorian times, they were very common. And here's a, a shot of Queen Victoria's funeral, where she has a very elaborate pall on, on her, um, her um, coffin as it traveled through the, um, through the streets. Now, of course, another very common um, Christian symbol is the cross. Um, we have um, this particular one is a gray granite cross, a simple gray granite cross. This is, I think, probably the most common cross that you'll see in Ross Bay Cemetery. Um, it's a rough hewn gray granite. And um, this one, uh, you often they're plain, but this one happens to have a symbol up here, which you see is the cross in the crown. And this is a symbol of the sovereignty of Christ. That's what the crown gives you. And it's the victory over death. So of course, the cross is a symbol of pain and suffering, but also redemption. And so you get those two combined on that. Now, these, this particular cross also, um, you'll see at the bottom of this um, cross, there's a couple of interesting inscriptions. And um, it just represents for this family in particular how touched it was by tragedy. The upper inscription just below the cross is in loving memory of John T. Davies, who fell in action May 20th, 1915. He was fighting, he was part of the Canadian Expeditionary Force, which was the, um, uh, the Canadian Army in the First World War. And he fell in action in the very, the first major um, a battle that the, the Canadians fought in, which was uh, the uh, Second Battle of Ypres. He has no known grave. Uh, he is memorialized on the Menin Gate in Belgium. Um, the, these kinds of inscriptions are quite common in Ross Bay and in other cemeteries of this period. Cemeteries are all about memory, memorializing people, tombstones. It's not just a place to, you know, toss a body. It's to remember people. And especially for these young men who were killed overseas, their bodies were never gonna be brought home. That was a policy at the time. So families wanted them to be remembered in the community. And so they were placed here. Um, they, they would have their memorial inscriptions placed here on the family grave. The other inscription here is for Herbert Davies and his beloved wife, Ellen, who drowned on the SS Sophia, Princess Sophia at Lynn Canal, Alaska. 
Um, this was uh, a major disaster. There are quite a few disasters memorialized in Ross Bay Cemetery. Uh, it was the Canadian Pacific steamer Princess Sophia um, that went down. Uh, she was she struck a reef on October 25th, 1918, the evening of October 23rd, 1918, and on October 25th she sank. Um, the, the, she was stuck on the reef for 40 hours. They were not able to rescue anyone. And there were over 350 men, women, and children on board. So besides the symbolism, you get other kinds of history on markers in a cemetery like Ross Bay. Now, another typical cross in Ross Bay Cemetery, and for this period as well, was the Celtic cross. The Celtic cross is the one that, like, that you see here with a circle around the middle cross of, of, the, uh, of the monument. It's a very ancient cross. It's associated with Celtic Christianity, um, especially in Ireland, Scotland, Wales, and Cornwall. Um, but it did become very popular in Victorian cemeteries for people not even with any Celtic heritage uh, through the late 1800s. The, uh, the circle is supposed to represent um, a couple of things. Uh, originally thought perhaps to be a fertility symbol, but as a Christian symbol, that's doubtful. Uh, it was uh, generally now uh, considered to either represent the power of the sun um, and eternity. A circle does represent eternity when you see it elsewhere. You'll see it on just like a whole, like a wheel or, or that on other graves. And, um, and then, of course, it surrounds the cross, which is the symbol of Christ and suffering. So you have heaven, which is the cross, and earth as well. So, um, so this particular one, some often they're plain, but this particular one is really beautifully embellished. And we'll take a closer look at the, uh, the upper part. And there's three types of symbols, that, well, actually four if you include the circle, uh, here, but on the cross itself, there's what looks like a dollar sign. And that's what I often get questions on school tours from kids asking why there's a dollar sign on some of the graves. But of course it's not. Um, what you have is that the center vertical bar is an I, then you have the H, and then you have the S. And that's I-H-S, which is the three um, first letters of Jesus' name in Greek. Now here across the crossbar, we have ivy. Ivy is evergreen. So immortality, eternal life. It also is clingy. So it can symbolize undying love and is often used on the graves of women and, and married couples. And the other beautiful carving we have on this one is this is a particularly gorgeous carving of the passion flower. Now the passion flower is a religious symbol. It doesn't stand for the passion like of, of human love. It stands for the passion of Jesus Christ. That is the agony that he went through um, in the lead up to his crucifixion, including the crucifixion and then resurrection. And passion flower is a real flower. And for those of you who aren't familiar with it, here's what the real thing looks like. Um, I've had passion flower vines growing here. I've had to take them out though, because they're like a real weed. Um, but the whole reason why they're thought to be a religious symbol is a couple hundred years ago, a priest looked at one of these and thought, oh, we could use this to teach about the passion. So according to him, these little um, frilly bits here on the outside, there's 72 of them, which stand for the number of thumb thorns in the crown of thorns. The three um, pistols, these dark red things here in the middle, stand for the, um, the nails that were used, one in each hand for Christ, and then one that went through both feet. The five stamens, which are a bit harder to see here, you see those are the green things stand for the five wounds uh, in Christ's body. The 10 petals are for the 10 apostles, the faithful apostles, because of course there was the two other ones, Judas who betrayed Christ and Peter who denied him. Um, and then there's a whole bunch of other <laughs> symbols, to, uh, symbolism to do with this, which you're welcome to look up. Now this cross, of course, obviously the scale of it, the beauty of it from a very wealthy family. Uh, Senator William MacDonald and his wife Catherine, they had a very large mansion over uh, in James Bay uh, where MacDonald Park is now. Uh, that was where their home Armadale was. 
Now, there, these are the common crosses, but there's a very unusual one as well in, uh, in Ross Feyre now on, on a newer marker. And, you know, it's, for, for a while, markers were very plain, but more and more we're seeing lots of images on, on markers because new technology makes that possible. This is called the Jerusalem Cross, also known as the Crusader Cross. And uh, it's uh, the origin of, of the name of it comes from the Kingdom of Jerusalem that was founded by Geoffrey de Bouillon in 1099 after the first crusade to the Holy Land. And uh, here's an image purported to be of him, although it was done 300 years after he died. So who knows what he actually looked like. However, uh, this does show um, his, the, the, the shield with the Crusader cross on it. <clears throat> Now, the, uh, the uh, Kingdom of Jerusalem, just to place that was, as I said, it was the first crusade, it was to the Holy Land, and it was now where parts of Israel, Palestine, and Jordan uh, uh, sort of overlapped all three of those. Um, it's, uh, it consists of, as you see, a large cross in the middle and then four smaller crosses. It has a variety of, of um, meanings. Uh, the central cross could stand for Christ and the four smaller ones could stand for the, uh, the four um, evangelists who wrote the Gospels of the New Testament. And that's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Or it could mean that that's Christ again in the middle as the strength or center of Christianity. And then the four crosses are the four corners of the earth where Christianity spread. Um, then also it could be that it represents the five wounds of Christ. That's the thing about symbolism. If you start looking up symbolism, it's rare that there is only one meaning for something. So the five wounds of Christ, the, the center big cross would be the, the, uh, the wound that was on his side and the four smaller ones would be the ones on his hands and feet. Now this, this particular marker is in the Catholic section, the one on the far east side of the, uh, of the um, cemetery and that's really the only place I've ever seen the uh, Italian requiescat in pace which is rest in peace uh, the Italian do I say Italian I meant Latin um because <laughs> of course Latin is traditional in the Catholic um uh, religion so let's go on to angels and of course we have lots of angels large and small it's my favorite big angel on the side to the left there the bossy angel uh, Giacomo Bossi um, made his fortune as a merchant and investing in real estate, so he's got a very fitting epitaph there. His word was his bond. Um, the little um, cherub over here on the right is so beautiful, and that's for Aphthalia Chungranus, who um, died at age 10 of meningitis. And again, beautiful little um, epitaph, our little darling. Uh, angels overall have a variety of roles. They, they symbolize spirituality in general, but they also serve as guardians of, of the tomb. Of course, in the, in the Easter story, um, they were standing, there was angels standing at the side of Christ's tomb when Mary Magdalene and the others came to, to see Christ. And of course, he wasn't there. He had resurrected. Um, they, they guide the soul up to heaven. They pray for the soul in purgatory or elsewhere. Um, and in general, they're, they're, the idea is that they point the, um, uh, the living, as you look at these, it points your, your attention towards heaven. Now, one of the most unusual angels that I've seen in the cemetery is this one here that has wings that look like fairy wings. And it kind of flummoxed me the first time I saw it because I really did think it might be a fairy. Um, but it's not. It's really interesting. It's from a, a, an image I found that you see here in the lower left. This I found online. I'm sorry for the quality of it. It was the best one I could find, which shows the angel carrying the child up to heaven. Now, ours is so badly um, uh, eroded that this marker would have been originally up standing vertically, and now it's lying down, so there's a lot of water sitting on it and gets walked over and, and everything, so it's eroding quite badly. So you can see the angel wings quite easily, and the uh, angel here, it's harder to see the child, so I just put this line here so you can see where the child is, and you can see that it matches perfectly. The, the image from a much more recent grave. And this was originally for Elizabeth Lang, who died in 1883 at the age of seven. I don't have a cause of death for her. Um, 
And there is another name on here, Jessica Lang, who died much later in 1942, and that was her sister. So the two sisters are buried here together. So just a quick visit to some other religious symbols. It's Easter Sunday. I think we can stick with the religious theme a little bit longer, the Christian religious theme. Um, on the far left, we have the um, sheaf of wheat. Um, now, the sheaf of wheat uh, has a couple of possible meanings. Uh, one is the divine harvest of souls, which to me has a kind of a creepy connotation of some kind of horror movie. But, um, you know, with God uh, gathering up all the souls uh, for resurrection. But it can also be used, uh, symbolize on an elderly person's stone. Um, that, that they are elderly, you know, they, they've reached their complete fruition and God has harvested their soul and taken them to heaven. And in this case, it suits the age of the person, Duncan McMillan, who died at the age of 68. You see, he's also got some ivy down below there. In the middle, we have Edward and Harry Bragg, father and son. Uh, at the top, on the left, we have uh, oak leaves. And the oak leaves, of course, are for strength, and also the power of faith. And on the right, we have olive branches. Olive branch, of course, the olive branch always in very many different uh, situations represents peace and can also represent healing faith. And we have lovely pillars here and that's the gate to heaven, they're entering heaven. Um, you'll see that Harry Bragg here was accidentally killed at the age of 27 in 1916. Well, I think today we would probably say accidentally died since we, tend to use the term killed more when there's some kind of agency. But um, what happened with Harry was he was out for an afternoon picnic with friends out to um, the area around Mount Finlayson. And he and another fellow decided they would climb Mount Finlayson. The other fellow turned back part way up and Harry kept on. But he didn't get back to his friends that afternoon. And they found him the next morning. He had slipped and fallen down quite far and, and died. Now on the far right, we have a dove and there are lots of doves in the cemetery. Sometimes they're flying up, sometimes they're flying down. Um, the, uh, the different meanings for what they're doing, if they're flying up, that's the soul going to heaven. In this case, we have the dove going down and that tends to represent the Holy Spirit coming to gather the soul up and take, take them up to heaven. Typically, the dove has the olive um, branch in its beak, and that's a reference back to Noah and the flood in the Old Testament, where um, the, um, they were out floating on the flood waters, Noah and his family and all the animals, and uh, waiting and waiting for a sign from God that they had hope of dry land, and that's they realized that they had dry land when the dove arrived with the um, olive branch in the beak. Now, again, you have pillars on this one, but you also have acanthus leaves um, on either side and at the top. Um, this is a, a very old traditional uh, image on tombstones. It comes from ancient Greece, um, where a, an architect saw an acanthus uh, plant growing around a child's grave and used it um, to, on the tops, you'll see acanthus leaves often on the tops of pillars. In fact, here, you see some right here, but also widely used in decorating um, monuments. This particular grave you see here for Thomas Bowden has a footstone. Um, right now it's propped up right against the, um, uh, the marker, but tr traditionally it would be at the foot of the grave. And there would have been lots of footstones in Ross Bay, but um, most, um, almost all of them are gone. And this one has just been moved up here to hopefully to keep it safe. Now, one more on a Christian theme, uh, a very remarkable set of images. I just find this, this uh, particularly the larger one you see here, really interesting. This is the marker for Martha Campbell. She died in 1886 at the age of 25 uh, from TB. And on her white bronze marker, it's a metal marker, not a stone one. We have these three images. Far left, we have the woman pointing to heaven. And the epitaph is, where immortal spirits reign, there shall we meet again. Then we have the woman with the anchor. Anchor is a very common symbol all over Ross Bay Cemetery. Sometimes it's associated with um, people who actually have a connection to the sea, you know, sea captains and that. But typically it's just a symbol of, of hope. Um, and so a 
Christian hope. And it's, there's a quote in the Bible that is related to it. Um, and in this case, uh, there is uh, an, uh, a, a biblical verse underneath it. I love them that love me and they that seek me early shall find me from Proverbs. But then the third image is this one of the woman draped on the cross. Um, and this one is very interesting. Uh, I, for those of you who are uh, Christians, you may remember a hymn called Rock of Ages. Rock of Ages cleft for me. I, I could sing it, but I won't inflict that on you. Uh, let me hide myself in thee. Let the water and the blood from thy riven side, which flowed, be of sin the double cure. Cleanse me from its guilt and power. This hymn became really popular and was widely illustrated. In particular, it was the image uh, from the third verse of the hymn was illustrated. Nothing in my hand I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. Naked come to thee for dress, helpless look to thee for grace. Foul I to the fountain fly, wash me savior or I die. So the rock of ages, you see the rock here, Christ is the rock of ages with a solid rock cross. The, um, the uh, ocean here is, it's an ocean of sin that is, you know, threatening the, this poor woman and she's draped there in her nighty. Um, the interesting thing I find about this particular image that appears everywhere, and if you Google it, you'll find millions of versions of this, they're always women. But I guess it's because men wouldn't look nearly so fetching um, displayed on a, on a cross like this in a, in, a, in a nighty kind of setup. But I just find it uh, to be a fantastic image. And um, just one more thing on the religious front. And that is for a religion that um, uh, is, very, is one of the uh, youngest of the world's independent religions. And it is showing up, there are, Im there are grave markers with these images showing up more and more uh, in Ross Bay Cemetery, and that is for the Baha'i religion. Uh, its central message is that humanity is one single race and that the day has come for the universe, unification of global society, both spiritually and materially. Uh, it's a religion of peace, it's worldwide. It originated in Iran uh, in the mid 1800s um, but like I say, it has spread worldwide. There are many Baha'i adherents here in Victoria. It, although it originated in Iran, uh, it is not a Muslim religion and in fact is persecuted in Iran uh, Baha'i members and uh, was a real issue for people, uh, Baha'i members in Egypt. Um, the symbol that you'll often see with the Baha'i on the Baha'i markers is the nine pointed star. And this one is one version of that. And on the next slide, I'll show you another one. Uh, and it's, uh, although the nine pointed star itself is not uh, an important part of the teachings, it's the number nine that is, and it's a symbol of perfection, uh, perfection and unity in numerology. Um, the other symbol on this particular um, grave is this crest up here, which is for the Royal Gloucestershire Hussars. Peter George Walter Holloway joined uh, this military unit in 1938, just before the war. Uh, and in 1941, he uh, arrived in Suez with his unit and joined the 8th Army 7th Division, the ones that were known as the Desert Rats. And uh, they went on to defeat Rommel's Africa Corps, so uh, very major service in the Second World War. Um, he came to Canada in 1954, to Victoria in 1984, and became Baha'i in 1992. And he's got a quote from one of, uh, from the, uh, from the Baha'i um, teachings, let the religions agree and make the nations one so that they may see each other as one family and the whole earth as one home. Now, as I mentioned, there is uh, also this other, uh, another example um, is uh, for this one, Joy McGarry. There are actually two grave markers side by side are close to each other. Um, her and her mother both have the Baha'i symbol. So this is a different version of a nine pointed star and it has on it what's called the ringstone symbol. It's apparently it's most often used actually literally on rings um, and has various, uh, it's very deeply symbolic. So the vertical that you have here, for, so first you have the three horizontal lines. The top one is God, the bottom one is, is um, uh, humanity, and the one in between 
uh, is the manifest are the manifestations of God represents the manifestations of God. So God's um, uh, God's um, energy and love comes down through the manifestations from God down to humanity. And the manifestations are people like Jesus and Muhammad and Abraham, and then the one specifically to Baha'i, uh, who um, the two stars represent, which are Bab and Baha'u'llah. Uh, they are the manifestations in the current era. So it's those, they, those are the ones that they look, that the Baha'i members look to guidance for, to understand God's will. So I think that's enough uh, heavy duty religious symbolism for an Easter Sunday. Let's look at some flowers and plants. The one on the left, oh, this is such a beautiful, beautiful marker, um, really beautifully carved. Um, you may have heard of the language of flowers from the Victorian period. It was, a, it was actually more of a fad, apparently. Uh, where specific meanings were attributed to um, flowers to convey feelings like friendship, love, but also other ones like anger and contempt and, and that. From what I've read recently about it, there's not much evidence that it was ever actually used in bouquets of flowers other than the ones about love. Um, but we also have separately from that the funerary language of flowers, which is what you see on tombstones. So they're not the same because there are actually different meanings. So for example, we have the calla lily here at the top of this particular monument. And in the, um, on, on, fun on tombstones, it symbolizes married love. Whereas in the language of flowers, it symbolizes pride or magnificent beauty. So not exactly the same. Now, as you see here, again, we have the passion flower here. And then we have down below ferns and ferns symbolize humility and sincerity. Um, this one has a, an interesting kind of epitaph, a wife so kind, a friend sincere, a tender mother to her children dear, in peace she lived, in love she died. Her life was asked, but God denied. It's an interesting kind of bitterness at the end of that one, which you don't often see in epitaphs like this. Usually it's like, oh, well, we gave, you know, our, our loved one to God and that's where they belong, but that's not how they felt on this one. On the right, we have this exquisite, exquisite carving of, of um, uh, Easter lilies. Of course, Easter lilies um, suitable to the time we're in and also um, very much associated with resurrection. It's a springtime image and, um, and uh, the Easter lilies, um, lilies of various kinds, are, of course, have very fragrant and were traditionally used in funerals before the days of um, embalming when they wanted, were used to disguise unfortunate odors. Um, the, uh, the gentleman who's buried here, Harry, spelled I-E, Harry Edward Darby, died in uh, 1919 at age 47, but he really had no connection with Victoria. As it says on the inscription at the bottom, he was uh, on his way home to England. So we have this, this description, this wonderful explanation of who he was and where he was coming from and where he was going. So he's of Billericay, Essex, England, and Sungay Tahoe Estate, Sungal Perak, for 25 years a planter in the Malay States. He died on Victoria BC, at Victoria, BC on his way home. So he was coming from Asia, stopped here in Victoria. His wife was with him and he had a stroke and died here. Um, a planter uh, means he operated a plantation, that is basically he was a farmer um, in Asia. And uh, it's interesting that they decided to die uh, to bury him here, even though by 1919 embalming was very common and uh, I suppose he could have been shipped home, but, but he wasn't. So we have this beautiful marker in Ross Bay Cemetery. On the left, on this next slide, we have another beautiful carving. This one, just of a rose. Now roses appear all over the place. They appear in uh, carvings of, of um, wreaths on the tombstones or single ones, you know, just a single rose on a tombstone. Now this one has two beautiful roses and their leaves here. And it's a symbol of enduring love and beauty. On the right, we have this uh, gorgeous thistle. Now, if you look up, if you Google thistle, the meaning of thistles on tombstones and that, of course, you get all kinds of connections to prickliness and maybe the crown of thorns or this or that. But the thistle is the official national flower of Scotland. And in Ross Bay Cemetery, as far as I can tell, without exception, it is used for people from Scotland, as you see here, Robert Lang, 
who died in 1882. There are a lot of Scots buried in Ross Bay Cemetery because of our connection with, um, with uh, the Hudson's Bay Company. The Hudson's Bay Company had many, many Scots employed. And so we have a lot of Scots there and often they do have thistles on their tombstones. Um, the uh, other, another one that, that you'll often see from this time period is the poppy. See on the far left here, uh, a, a, an opium poppy and its little bud here. Now, this is a very traditional symbol of eternal sleep. The poppy um, was the opium poppy in particular. Uh, the Greeks and Egyptians developed sleeping potions from it. And so that was, um, you know, a way of indicating eternal sleep. Of course, at the time that, uh, that uh, Eliza Bednall um, was living and died, opium was a legal substance here in Canada. And in fact, Victoria had lots of opium factories right up until 1908 when, when it was made legal. In the middle, you see a picture of a fantastic, another fantastically carved marker. Um, it's not big, but it's very full of, of symbolism. You see a detail here on the right. Of course, it's a broken pillar right off. That means a life cut short. And it is in fact for a child, nine years and 10 months old, Lila Engelhart. And you can see at the bottom, a very traditional epitaph for a child's grave, budded on earth to bloom in heaven. Um, Often on a child's grave, you'll just find a simple little flower bud carved. And that's what that, that um, indicates, of course, the child, like the flower bud, started life, never had a chance to open up and fully flower. But look at all the flowers on this child's grave. Um, you have all kinds of, of things, so, some that uh, you, I haven't really seen much of elsewhere in Ross Bay. So the far left over here, you see there's a morning glory. Of course, resurrection closes at night, opens in the morning with the sun. You have a sunflower, uh, which is for gratitude and affectionate remembrance, and also because it follows the sun. Again, light, eternal life. Something that uh, is very rare too in Ross Bay Cemetery. Below the sunflower in the middle here, you see daffodils. It was, I was, this was quite a find for me to find daffodils. Um, of course, a perennial that comes out in spring, rebirth and new life, love and hope, and also represents the innocence of youth. Um, there are other things here, daisies for innocence and, and anemones for um, brief life and things like that. But again, you see this, this cloth here, the coffin pall, um, draped over the this the um, the pillar, so very just chock full of, of symbolism. Now let's turn to something completely different. Um, this is this is a tale of my own mis mis misinterpretation of um, of symbolism. First of all, though, I just want to point out here's another example at the top there of uh, a, a Celtic cross. This one very plain, just the circle and the cross. The Agnew family. Uh, grave, completely enclosed with a wall, beautifully designed, was designed by Samuel McClure. Um, I'm sure many of you who are local recognize McClure's name. He's very famous, mostly for the houses that he's built around town uh, that he was an architect for, um, but uh, he was a, a very well-known architect here and on the mainland. Uh, the Agnew family, obviously, by the scale of this, this grave, was very well off. Um, William Agnew, the, the um, um, uh, patriarch of the family, made his fortune uh, in the silk trade in Montreal and then retired out here for his wife's health. The way this monument is set up is that you have this main arch here with the marble inset and on there is the names of the people buried there plus a memorial inscription to their son who was killed in the First World War. And then within the, the confines of the wall, you have these slabs down here, uh, two going sideways and one coming straight out for William the Patriarch from this monument. This unfortunate holly tree here in the corner does not belong there, was not part of the original image. Um, it could have it's possible it was planted there, but it's more likely that it either came from a wreath that somebody put a holly wreath or birds flying over and depositing holly berries. So what my uh, my mistake was is interpreting this symbol here on each of these slabs. So this is William Agnew. 
And I very quickly came to the conclusion the first time I saw this, that uh, this was the eternal flame. So you have the flame and you have, it's an Aladdin's lamp type of eternal flame. Eternal flame, very typical uh, symbol in cemeteries for eternal life, uh, immortality. But in fact, that's not what it is at all. This is a close up of it. In the center, we have a bird and underneath it, we have this ribbon. And on this ribbon are words. Now they're very hard to see here. Um, you can maybe barely make out a C at the top and then an O, but what it is, it's a, I think rather poor representation of the family crest of the Agnew family. And here it is, you see this, this little sad little bird in the middle there is actually an eagle. Um, I don't, can't make out anything that looks like uh, wings on the, the one that's on the actual grave, but if it certainly appears in all of the images that I've seen of the Agnew family crest. Concilio non impetu is the family motto, by wisdom, not force. Now in recent years, it's interesting that um, more recently than, than this one for sure, a lot of family crests have started, crests of various kinds have started appearing on graves. And here we have the Ramsey family marker. This is a very new marker. It's only been put up in the last, I think, couple of years, if not even earlier, like maybe even in the last year. Um, on the front side, they interestingly use the DOD, de date of death indicator. Um, that's very different. Uh, throughout Ross Bay, died is the term that's been used, but they chose DOD. Um, the first grave was for George Dyer, as you see there, 1929 down at the bottom. And the most recent one is the last one was 1988. So um, it, I don't know if there was a marker at all on this grave beforehand, but it certainly now has all of these people. And you see, although the last names are different, the all of these people would have been related to one another. Um, the graves in Ross Bay, they don't sort of randomly put people in graves. You have to have a family connection. Uh, the, the patriarch, George Dyer, uh, came to Victoria in 1890 as a machinist and eventually had his own business, um, Ramsey Machine Works. Um, George Dyer, Ramsey, Dyer is his middle name. Um, and so on the back of it, they have placed the um, Ramsey family crest, which you see here. And it's got a unicorn on it. I think a very, very fierce looking unicorn. And that's, I looked up why the uh, um, things on crests and that have their tongues sticking out. Apparently it's to make them look more fierce. Uh, and the Ramsey family motto is work and pray. Um, I wonder if anybody has the one work and play, but this is definitely work and pray. The unicorn is the traditional, uh, uh, image of animal of Scotland, even though it's a mythical animal. And uh, it's, uh, it's supposed to represent bravery, innocence, purity, healing powers, pride, intelligence, joy, and virility. Uh, interesting that it is considered the natural enemy of, of, of the lion. And of course, England's uh, emblem is the lion. The Scottish Royal Coat of Arms has two unicorns on it. Um, the United Kingdom, because it includes Scotland, includes a lion for Britain and a unicorn for Scotland. Now, this one has uh, two kinds of crests on it. We have the um, uh, one we have. Well, first of all, I have to I have to mention the uh, the lovely. Um, epitaph on this one for Donald Davy Wilson, reluctantly returned imperfect. Um, I looked up his, uh, epitaph, his uh, obituary and it's, it's amazing how, like he was, he was died in 2012, but lots of people's obituaries um, from the, right going back some of them to the 1990s are still available online. And in his obituary, it says that he chose this epitaph himself. I, I tried Googling it and I can't find any other, um, you know, um, link for anything, because often when you find uh, sayings like that, if you Google it, it's from a poem or a saying or something, but it looks like he actually came up with that all on his own. And I guess he was very proud of his, um, his heritage, because he has the Wilson family a crest here. Now, that is specifically the English Wilson family crest. There are Wilson's 
all over the place in the United Kingdom and in Europe. And they all use the very nasty looking wolf here. And most of them have the three stars. But what's different, depending on whether they're Irish, Scottish, Welsh, whatever, is the middle star is replaced by something. So um, in the Irish ones, it's replaced, the middle star is replaced by a harp. So obviously, David, Donald Davy Wilson is from the English um, one. And then below him is his wife, Frances Pennington Wilson, RN. So she was a registered nurse. And I don't know if she chose it or if her family chose her to have the crest of the Royal Jubilee Hospital um, Alumni Association. So she's a grad of the Jubilee Hospital and I love her epitaph. She was an angel. And again, proud of their family history, their descend descendants and relatives of Pennington and McGraw. So now I'm getting close to the end. Uh, just thank you and farewell. The thank yous from me. The farewell is to Elizabeth Strathairn Colvin, as you see here. She of the backward Z. So look, uh, look on, on her tombstone there, Elizabeth with the Z backwards. I wonder how the family felt about that. Uh, it is possible to make corrections to a tombstone and I have seen that done where they carve in a, uh, a little, they cut, they cut out the mistaken uh, letter and then they carve in a new one. So you have this sort of little indent, but I guess nobody bothered with this one, but you have this perfectly beautiful, beautiful handshake here. Um, you can tell it's a, a husband and wife, the husband on the right, with his cuff, you see the buttoned cuff, and the wife on the left with her fancy little cuff, and then on either side, the roses for enduring love, and above the beautiful, beautiful carving of the lilies of the valley. Again, a springtime perennial comes out in the spring, it's white, it's fresh, it's resurrection, it's new life, um, but sad because they're saying farewell. The, um, that just more brings me more or less to the end of my talk. I just wanna put in a few plugs for the upcoming tours. Uh, next week's tour, which will be in the cemetery in all likelihood, unless we have a really bad <laughs> storm. Uh, John Azar will be giving a tour about, uh, on the topic of Victoria's militia goes, go, militias go, go, my Victoria's militia goes to war, about the First World War. And the week after that will be the first of our annual Emily Carr tours. We always do two every year. And so this will be the first one. It will be on Zoom as well. We are continuing with the Zoom tours until further notice, until the restrictions, the COVID restrictions are, are, listed, uh, are lifted. Um, some of those uh, will be in the cemetery. Um, I think probably the Emily Carr tour because it involves um, Molly Raher Newman portraying Emily Carr and, and reading her um, words along with uh, several of us doing the introductions will probably be like this on a Zoom presentation. But I'm very much looking forward to seeing you all again sometime soon um, in the cemetery where we can actually spend time in that beautiful space and uh, get together once again. So thank you very much. And I will stop sharing my screen right now hopefully there we go there we go so i'd be happy to answer questions or have comments if anybody uh, wants to say anything thank you yvonne for an amazing tour i learned a lot <laughs> thanks steve anybody else yeah i'd like to second steve's uh congratulations it went it went really really well and I think even though it probably isn't that windy out there today, I think this topic worked really, really well with this, with this format. And um, you were able to show the, the little um, extra slides so that those of us with bad eyesight could actually see. <laughs> we didn't have to grovel on the, the ground and, and get up really, really close. And uh, you know, I, I've done symbolism tours myself and I've been through the cemetery so many times. You showed me some of the monuments I know, but. I either got the symbols wrong or I'd never noticed them at all. And uh, I, I'd never seen those Baha'i ones. You'll have to show me where they are sometime. But uh, mm. this was great. So thank you.
Oh, oh, you're welcome, John. And uh, same thing for me, you know, every time I walk through the cemetery, I'm always looking and I'm often see things I've never noticed before, you know, it's like, oh, you know, where did that come from? And, uh, and then, you know, having to figure out and then of course, there's the thing like I was saying about how um, there's so many meanings to things. Sometimes it, it, it helps, you know, once you find out something about the person who's buried there it helps you interpret what the, the intended meaning might have been. So uh, there's there's a really beautiful one that I didn't include today where there's uh, it's two flower buds connected to one another. And uh, I uh, when I first saw that, I thought, well, that's very strange. I never see anything like that. Turns out that symbol means it's a mother and child where the child died either during or just after childbirth, as did the mother. And sure enough, when I looked up the history of that, uh, the, the people buried there, that's exactly what had happened. So yeah, new discoveries all the time. Yeah. Any other questions, comments? Well then, I just guess that we will say um, farewell. <laughs> uh, shake hands. <laughs> Thank you very much to you on for a lovely tour. Oh, thanks. It was great fun doing it. I'm just looking at some of the comments now. Yeah, some other people commenting on the format and stuff. Yeah, I think that's why I decided on this for, for this particular tour, because like, as you said, John, in terms of actually seeing the, the images on the stones, it, you know, it's, it's not always easy, even like when you're right in the cemetery, unless you get down really close. And also the light, it really depends on the lighting that you get, you know, whether it's direct sun or, uh, or not. So, um, so oh, yeah. it, it really made a difference. So thank you, everybody. And I hope uh, we'll see you somewhere on Zoom <laughs> next week for the tour. Bye now. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye.